Okay, so just super quickly, Alexa's bio here, so, and it's long. Okay, so 2008, which was a fabulous time for the economy, which is why I think she's gonna have some stuff to say about the time that we're going through now. She actually started her company then. Uh, it was called LearnVest. She wrote a book. I'm almost done with it. Uh, the LearnVest program, it has really helped me. It's, I think maybe at the time, it was sort of the only financial platform that kind of translated finance into you know language that we all understand made it not scary right not intimidating so super grateful to you for starting learn best i mean you raised over 75 million dollars um, and actually was acquired by northwestern mutual in 2015 um, and it was one of the biggest fintech acquisitions of the decade now of course alexa is a woman here so there's always that next step of wow this is you know a person who isn't normally funded right we don't see women raising as much money um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, you worked at Northwestern for some time, and then eventually you went on to start your own fund, Inspired Capital. Of course, during this whole time, we've got this book, we've got another book, got on the New York Times bestseller. Oh, and you have three children, which were also questions that I received about how the hell do you balance all of this? Um, we only have an hour, so we're going to just talk as quickly as we can here. Uh, let's just start at the beginning, um, the beginning of the beginning. Um, there is a quote that I read um, by somebody, you know, an interview that somebody did with you and you had this really great response and you said, quote, before you take the leap, before you jump, really make sure it's going to be something you want to get out of bed to do every day because it is so hard. So you want to make sure you're really committed. How do you know that you're ready to commit? That sounds like a personal relationship question, but you know, you have a relationship with your business. Yeah. How, how were you at the time of 2018 feeling really confident that, you know what, this is what we're going to do? Um, well, so I think the first thing was, um, I was one of the founders who I saw a problem. I felt like Americans couldn't get access to affordable financial advice. I felt like people were always very wary of anyone gives them advice and I said I think we can build a company that can make that different and so what Learn Best was um, when we got acquired we, we effectively were TurboTax for a financial plan for America and my story of why I started it was really authentic um, one uh, as I was growing up um, I remember you know my parents were always good at teaching me to save and some of the basics but then when I went to college and I went to Harvard um, and I say that on purpose because literally I got a great education, but nobody ever taught me a single thing about how to think about my wallet or my savings or any of our, um, the basics of money. And I said, I can't believe I'm getting such a great education. And like what critical things in life is so hard for me to do. And so the idea for Learn Best, literally learn, earn, invest. That's where the, the name came from. It was really straightforward. And I said, as I got my first job out of school and I said, I want to never have debt. I want to be safe with my finances. And I couldn't believe that there was no place for me to go to get good at money. And so in short, um, I decided that I wanted to go build it. And that's what Learn Best uh, became. And so uh, what I tell people out there is if you don't love fashion, don't start a fashion company. If you don't love food, don't start a food company. If you don't love you know pets, don't start a pets company. Start something that you really love. And one of the things like I really love I love math. I've always been very good at investing. I love it. And so for me, this was a company that speaks to who I am. And you know, now I, I run a $200 million venture fund um, at, called Inspired Capital. Everybody should follow Inspired Capital. Follow me. I'm always happy to, to you know answer questions and try to be good to everybody. Um, but what became really obvious to me was that this is something I could do forever. And I... You know, I, I really do tell people, do something that you would do for free because you will end up winning. And so now, you know, as an investor, I love talking to entrepreneurs all day. And actually, my husband said to me once, you know, once I sold Learn Fast, I was thinking about what to do next. Nights and weekends, I was talking to founders and helping them build their businesses. And he literally said to me, you would do this every day for free. Mm -hmm. You love it. At the book to them. And I was like, I, think I, I should do this for a living. Done. And it just, it was, it took 10 seconds. And it was such a good moment when he said it to me. And so, um, you know, I was raised by I, my mom is 72. She works every day of her life still. She's a nurse. She loves taking care of people. It feeds her soul. And so I was raised by people who always said, 
love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And I actually think it's the exact opposite, which is if you love what you do, you will literally work every day of your life and you will love it and you will be good at it and it will be blurry and there will be no life balance, but you will be really happy and really satisfied and really successful. Yeah, no, and I, it's something my grandfather uh, who owned his own business, that that's a, something he told me, he said, you'll never work a day in your life. But I think there is a difference between being challenged, being stimulated, and it being so hard that it's not right for you, right? Because we're all working really hard at our jobs, but there is a, a fine line, I think, between it being something you're passionate about and being something that, you know, others expect you to do, or, you know, money is kind of the, the carrot that's dragging you along, but you know instinctually, you know, in your soul that it's not quite right. Did you, did you ever have that in your career before you started LearnVest? I did. I actually, um, you know, I'm a people person. I like people. Um, I, I really like helping people. And I, I definitely had a handful of jobs before this where, you know, I was behind a spreadsheet all day. That's all I was doing, not getting to interact with people. And, you know, that Sunday night feeling where you get the Sunday scaries and you're kind of miserable and you don't want to go to work. I've had that before too. And I think what I realized was when you have too many of those on Sundays and when you know, there's, I'm challenged every day. I'm getting better at things every day. There's so many things that I need to do um, to get better. But there's a difference between being truly not a fit where you're, you're miserable. You know the difference. Like, I have to get better. I have to course correct. There's things I have to keep working on. But I, I know what I'm good at. Um, and I think that's another pretty critical piece of advice I once got from somebody, which is they said, as early as you can in your life, Figure out what you love, figure out what you're good at, yeah. and do both. Yeah. And the sooner you do it, the more successful you be. And so there's definitely skill sets where if I was a lawyer behind, you know, uh, you know, behind the scenes staring over papers all day, I would be miserable. Right. That would not work for me. That, that is not a career that I would feel good about. Right. And so I think what, um, you know, get really, and you don't always have to know what you love. Get good at saying what you don't love. Mm. That's all. That's all. To be like, no thanks, right. don't love this, don't love that, don't love this, and be really honest with yourself. Don't do things that other people say you should love. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part. That's the hardest part of, of, of life is not just doing things that other people are telling you you right. should do, doing things you really want to do yourself. Right. And, and I think, I mean, you just said the best word here, which is should, being very aware of when you're telling yourself, I should. Um, and, and an instinct, right? Like being really able to tap into in the bottom of your soul, right? Your gut and how that feels. I'm going to just transition here to the 2008 question because I think it's kind of relevant to now and, and, you know, economic uncertainty. How was it starting a company in 2008 and did you have trouble raising money for it? Yeah, I mean, it was terrifying. And I think actually it's one of the, again, back to, you know, I don't think any of us could have predicted COVID or what's happened in the world. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. And it's really, it's really, really probably the scariest time I've ever lived through. Um, I, I believe there's this like inner voice that talks to you. And I was listening to that voice really clearly. And that inner voice was like, Alexi, you need to go build this business. You believe in learn best, go do it. If you don't do it, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And so when I, I dropped out of Harvard Business School, and to be clear, it was not cool, it was not hip. Like mm -hmm. now, it's kind of, I think it's now become very in vogue to drop out of school um, and to be a founder. At that time, it was not. And I really was, um, you know, swimming against the grain. And I felt like I was swimming against the grain. And, you know, in 2008, if you remember what it was like, people hiding money under their mattresses, there were no jobs. And I was in this very, very safe place um, of Harvard Business School where, like, for the following two more years, I wouldn't have to figure out my life. I could just stay in this cocoon. And I do have this deep instinct that when everybody zigs, zag. Mm -hmm. When everybody's running this way, run the opposite way. Um, and the reason for that in business is it allows you to be in a place that nobody else is. Mm -hmm. You get to have better access to um, uh, ideas. Uh, and you, you, know, you either want to be way out in front of everybody. So a year or two before somebody sees something happening, you want to get there first. Or when everyone's you know excited about one thing, you want to go find the next thing that people are going to be excited about. And so so what was it like, you asked? It was miserable. I, mean, I dropped <laughs> people that I was nuts. People thought I was crazy. 
Um, what did your family I, think? Um, my family was wonderful. They were truly, truly wonderful. And I think, um, you know, they, they it, it's funny, um, the thing that my family said was obvious. They were like, of course, that's what you're going to do. Um, and my mom, I, I actually wanted to drop out of college uh, when I was a senior. And my mom said, can you please just graduate? And so I think the fact that back that two years later, I was like, I really, really, really want to go do this. Hold on one I second. Think- I'm asking you to unmute on Zoom. Um, I realize it just went back to mute. There okay. we go. Okay, good. There you go. Um, I, so, oh, and there's feedback. There we go. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit longer and then the feedback might be, uh, okay. let's say I'm going to just turn down the volume on my phone. Okay, perfect. Go okay. Through the thing, let's see if that works. Otherwise, we'll prioritize you guys on Zoom. Um, how's, that? how's that? How's that? A little bit better. So did you turn down the volume all the way on, on your phone? Yep, it's as low as it can go with me still hearing you. Is that better? How about everybody in the chat, uh, all the participants here and everybody here on Instagram Live, if you just want to let us know how the feedback is on your end. I'm hearing it a bit on mine, um, but I can, it's echoing. Okay. Yeah, it's echoing. Okay. All right. Well, we tried. All right, Instagram Live, you got the first, you know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes here. So consider yourself lucky. Uh, but next time, go to ladiesgetpaid.com backslash calendar. And that's where all of our future events are there. Um, so, uh, so, so. Come on to ladiesgetpaid.com and let's make it happen. Okay. And Instagram Live. It almost, it almost happened. All right. Well, we're back here. Okay. Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, everybody, you can also follow me on Instagram and send me messages after. So I'm just at Alexa Von Topol. Nice. Anybody who's on who says, get in touch with me. I'm always like, be careful what you wish for because everybody in this community will get in touch with you. But hopefully, hopefully today we're going to be answering a lot of their questions, which, you know, as I mentioned before, I sourced from them and we got a lot. Um, by the way, everybody who's joining now, I realize uh, we got started a little bit early because apparently I'm super type A. Uh, so thanks for joining. And we did start recording from the beginning. So we'll, we'll have all that good stuff that we've Hi, everybody. Uh, yep. And then, so right now we're at starting Learn Vest. We're at the beginning. We're at 2008. Not a great economy. You drop out of Harvard. Um, so all this sounds a little bit like it's not going to work, right? <laughs> like we're starting in a bit of a question here, but you have conviction, uh, and uh, and and so you you keep going. Your mom's not thrilled. How did you stick to your guns and yeah, and, nope. and raise yeah. it? You asked the question of, was it scary when I dropped out of business school in 2008 to start Learn Vast? And um, what I was saying is my family was actually really supportive and they were very thrilled. And um, I think it was because they knew I would regret it if I didn't do it. And they said, we're rooting for you. And so I moved to New York. Um, I cried the entire flight there. I, like truly, I was like, what the hell did I just do with my life? And I think it's actually really important sometimes just to feel, to let your emotions out Mm -hmm. And then I woke up the next day and I said, I already cried yesterday. I can't do that today. I opened my laptop and I just started working. And I think, so I studied undergrad um, psychology in, 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 in happiness. And a few things are worth saying. Number one, this is the only life you get. You got to live it. You got to be true to yourself. And there has to be this deep conviction of just, I don't care what other people think. And I actually think I developed a pretty good muscle around that where I was like, I am living for my own life, not anybody else's. And I'm going to have lots of people ask questions and I can't make everybody happy. And the sooner that I just embrace that one, the better. So I was 24 years old and I was like, I can't live somebody else's life. Um, so, so that was number one. Number two was I just started working and I literally opened my laptop and I just started going and progress begets progress. Success begets success. And like the momentum started picking up. And that doesn't mean that I didn't have moments where people said, no, I'm not interested in investing in your company or no, I don't want to follow your company. But I just said, no problem. I'll come back to you next time. And I kept moving and I just didn't let it dent my self-esteem because, and I think that's probably actually a little skill set I have, which is I can't make everybody happy. I, I assume half the time, most people will say no. And I just move on and I keep going. And I think what I found through that was um, you'll find your people. You'll find the people who love you. You'll find the people who say yes. You'll find the people who believe in you. And the flywheel started going. And you know, over the next five years, we raised five rounds of venture funding, 75 million in total. 
Um, on our fifth birthday, we literally sold the company for $375 million to North Farshall Mutual. Actually sold the company on a Wednesday. Had my first child that weekend. I was so, going to ask you. Yeah. So if you ever want to know what it's like to literally have every part of your being under stress, that's where I was. My mental stress, my emotional stress, physical stress, all at the same time. Um, and I just learned that I have a new gear in me that's really reliable, which is when shit hits the fan, I get very calm and I just focus on work and I just take it one day at a time, one hour at a time. And so again, I, I say all of this because like, I'm a normal person. Like, don't let the fact that I went to some fancy schools, like I grew up, I was born in Kentucky. Both my parents were in the army. I lost my dad when I was young. My mom is a nurse practitioner. I was raised by a single mom from 14 onwards. And I just believe in hard work and I believe in really being true to yourself. And it's really hard to do sometimes, but the sooner you start to do it, the better. The, you'll find the people who love you. You'll find the people who want to root for you. Um, and I remember actually being on a call like this, you know, when I was 22 and seeing some great entrepreneur do something really successful. And I remember what it's like to be you and think, oh my God, I can never do that. And the truth was, I just worked hard. Um, and it wasn't that I had any fancy relationships or anything special. I just put my head down and I worked hard and I believed in myself. And I think um, that everybody can do. And that's one of the things I love about America is if you put your head down and work hard, you will find people who want to back you and believe in you. And the world is actually a good place. Um, people like me want to pay it forward and want to help other people. And so I think I'm also probably a very positive person. That's another thing I probably should have said. That is maybe one thing that I'm special at is being very optimistic and positive. Yeah, no, and I, I feel the same way. Um, let's talk about you being 24 years old, okay? You didn't have that much work experience. How did you learn how to do this? I mean, obviously you were learning as you went along, but do you remember any moments you know, early on where you had these, okay, there's a paradigm shift happening or wow, that was a lesson that I needed to learn. Uh, and also, did you remember any like books or people were asking about resources that they could go to if they're interested in starting a business? Yeah. I mean, I think um, first, guys, I was bad at lots of things. And like <laughs> most of the time I was just like making, I was figuring things out. Um, and I remember waking up after five years of running Learn Us and being like, I have literally had to learn so many things, but it, it was more of just the roll up your sleeves and go learn it. Like everybody around, you know, is is, is capable, is smart. And like, none of the things were that complicated. They're just annoying to have to learn. Um, where, um, but, but, you know, I just believe in hard work and you can Google almost anything. Um, there's great books that are out there. Um, I would actually recommend everyone listen to my podcast on my podcast. It's, a, it's literally called the founders project with Alexa Von Tobel. Listen to it every week. Every week I take an incredible founder and I ask how they got there. And what you learn is, it, it just people sharing their stories and you, you it, it just that like listen to that, you know, on two times speed. So it takes 20 minutes to do while you run or exercise or whatever it may be. Um, but what I, what I basically learned was by the end of it, I looked back and I said, Oh my God, I've learned so much. I've learned how to incorporate a company, how to run a company management. Um, there were things I did stupidly, um, but get a good lawyer, get a good accountant. Those are two places you can't afford to get wrong. So don't get them wrong. Um, and then surround yourself with people who will tell you the truth, um, and listen to people's negative feedback because you know, when you have it, you know, if I always ask people when I'm interviewing them, I say, what is something that your spouse, your best friend and somebody you work with had said to you as a piece of feedback? Cause if three people like that have all said something negative, it's true and you should probably fix it, right? And I had lots of things I wasn't doing well and I learned the things that I thought I could get better and then the things I knew I would never get. Like, I'm never gonna be a patient person. It's not, I'm a great entrepreneur because I'm not patient and I want the world to change now and I want things to go faster now. Um, and so I surround myself with people who slow me down, who will say, let's take two extra days and really process that. So you quickly learn what you're good at and what you're bad at and focus on the things you're really good at and do them superhumanly. And the things you're really bad at, surround yourself with people who can fill in those gaps. Um, if you met my husband, he's like the yin to my yang. He's like, let's go slow. 
let's like triple, triple check everything. And then some days I'm like, go faster. You're driving me nuts. But it's what makes us a great team. Yeah. Um, Ashley, my co-founder, I can see her on chat and I know she's nodding because this is completely, we, I hear that. Uh, we get so many questions uh, and concerns from women about getting feedback and taking it. Uh, they, they see it as sort of a personal indictment on their self-worth or their identity. So you know, on behalf of them, I'm going to ask you here, how do you filter the feedback? How do you know, right, that this is somebody worth, worth listening to? Uh, and then how do you not get knocked down? You know, being a positive person obviously helps, but those are two of one of, you know, our community. We get these questions all the time. Yeah. I mean, so again, I've had, I mean, let me just like run through. I've, um, I once at 25, I hired an executive coach, by the way, this is a thing that you can really only do if you have enough money at the company pay for it. But I intuitively said to myself, so I was an athlete. Um, and I do think athletics translates a lot to being an entrepreneur because it's about getting really good at something that you start out not being good at. Um, and in athletics, I had a coach, right? So I, I was on the diving team at, at, in college. I literally dove platform and it just explains why I'm not. It's like anyone who hurls off of a 10 meter platform is crazy. Um, and I, I had a coach and I remember my coach, you know, they set the pace, they make you go faster, they make you run harder, they make you do sit-ups that you don't want to do. It's all of that. And so I said to myself, I, I'm 24. I'm a first time CEO. I've never done this before. Yeah, I can read some books, listen to podcasts. There's so much good content out there, but I really need somebody up close and personal who's going to be tough on me. And so I intuitively hired somebody. And I remember that first day of working with the person, he said, can I interview your board, your husband, your family, your management team? And I was like, well, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> And my husband started laughing. He's like, I'm pretty sure that's what you signed up for. And I was like, really uncomfortable, truly uncomfortable. But I said, I signed up for this, sure. And I just trusted the process. And what came back was lots of things. And, you know, things about my management style that they loved, things that they didn't like. And we created a psychological safe space of like, no one's perfect. I'm far from perfect. I will never pretend that I have it all figured out. There are tons of things I'm bad at. Um, but then I realized actually like the fact that I even went through that process showed my team that I care about being better and that itself is a good thing. And they gave me feedback and there were certain things that it was like, Oh, I can definitely do these things. Well, and I'll give you an example. Um, naturally because I, I move at a fast speed. I, I am a very good listener. Like I truly care about people's input. I, but because I move fast, I had to simply learn to say, is there anything else you want to make sure I've heard? So people that feel heard, but there were moments where people didn't totally think I was listening or fully paying attention, but it's because I had listened, I heard, and I moved on to the next thing. And so I learned a simple way to say, hey, do you think I've been listening? Mm. And what came out of that was like, it's a really simple fix. And now people know they're fully being heard. And it was just such a simple thing I could do. So mm. simple. Um, and that's a good example. The impatient, she moves fast. I'm never going to slow down. And so I often make sure, hey, are you going to be comfortable knowing that I'm always going to move really fast? And I can then make sure I'm hiring people that are going to like and understand that. And in fact, it's funny, I've even gotten people that are like, Alexa, I miss that. I don't work with people who move as fast anymore. Um, and so again, it's just, it's, it's, it's about learning how you're perceived, what you can do better. And then it's like, there's certain things that you don't have to filter. So the, the punchline is you said, how do you filter? One, make sure you get the feedback that you hear in a lot of places and you know it when somebody says it in all the places in your life, you're like, okay, I'm bad at this. Number two, Surround yourself with people who are good at giving you the feedback. So expert, really smart friends. You don't have to pay a lot of money to an expert or a coach. At one point, I literally just asked all my best friends, what's something I can be doing better? Even the fact that they asked that, they were like, I'm so grateful that you care about being better. It's just, it's really small things. Um, but then finally, um, really create the psychological safe place around you that people know they can tell you the hard things. Cause here's the truth guys, nobody wants to say the hard things to anybody. 
And if you actually want to get good, you, my husband tells me the toughest things. And I, half the time I'm like, I know, but it's, I don't want him to stop saying them because they're the right things I need to hear. And so it's really about surrounding yourself with people who will do that. Mm -hmm. And part of, I think what you're saying here is lean into your strengths, right? Like you being an impatient person is what makes you a fabulous entrepreneur, but also temper it a little bit, right? You don't want to get rid of the thing that you're good at, but you understand the moments where you may need to listen more or, or slow down. So I think for everybody listening here, it's kind of a balance. And at the end of the day, it's really knowing yourself. Um, have you read the book Radical Candor by Kim Scott? Um, I've, I've read portions of it. Yeah, because it sounds, you know, when you talked about creating a psychological safe space for people, you know, to be able to be candid, you know, with each other and, and to give feedback on both sides. Um, so anybody, here, please, please look that book up. It really, I think, gives the the tangible instruction to the great requests you just made. Um, you also talked about hires, right? Surrounding yourself with people um, who balance you. And we got a question from somebody asking about uh, your first hire, but maybe you can talk about your first few hires. Um, well, first of all, my first ever real hire is actually on this call with us. Um, uh, she was uh, a phenomenal undergrad in college who I convinced to come join for our internship program. <laughs> internship, there's no program. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've always done is I, I, one, I like people who are different than me. I like people who are extremely bright, ex low ego, hardworking. Um, and I think that, and then I love them. And truly, I keep the people that I love and trust with me. And one great thing about Inspired Capital is it's literally a team of people that I've worked with maximum 20 years, minimum 10. Wow. Where like that DNA of radical candor and toughness and is so important. And the low ego piece is critical because as even I sit here, like I'm an imperfect human who's trying to consistently keep getting better and evolving. And we live in a world that's evolving every minute. And so like, we're all beginners at almost everything all the time because the world is moving. The puck is constantly in flux. And so I really like people who do not take for granted hard work um, because you can't be the best if you're not always working hard. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm a robot. Like I, a husband that I love, three little kids that I love, and I pretty much do work and family and you know, my house is often a mess or I don't exercise as much as I want to. Like, you know, I have all the same struggles that other people do. Um, and but I love my job. And so I do like to work a lot and it's really fun for me. And one of the things I've been teaching my five-year-old little daughter, her name's Toby. Um, I named her actually after my dad. Um, Toby, I tell her every day, I'm like, mommy loves work. And I say, you know how you love puzzles? I'm like, I do puzzles all day long at work. They're just big puzzles with people involved and strategy and mommy's good at it. And so she loves to do it. Mm, mm. And I think it's really important to work as something that's really great for kids too. Mm -hmm. And also your modeling behavior um, for them and you're demonstrating to them that it is even possible to love what you do. For, for a living. Um, you mentioned balance earlier. You said there is sort of no balance, but that's not a bad thing, right? Especially if you love what you do, kind of the edges get blurred here. So maybe the question is burnout, right? Because you're doing a lot all the time. There's got to be moments where you're on the edge of burnout, or maybe you have gone through it. So advice, let, let's talk about that. Yeah. So um, I really do think taking a proper vacation is important. Um, and, you know, one, I'll just say, I've been wearing a Fitbit for eight, nine years um, because it, it monitors my sleep, my exercise. And I always know if I get too far off on sleep or exercise, I don't become a great human. Um, I, just none of us are our best selves. Um, and if I don't feel healthy, I'm not my best self. So I think um, so that's one thing that actually keeps me from like going over the edge. Um, and I really swear by it. Um, the second thing that I do is, um, I love friends. Like I'm a normal person. And if I don't see a friend, um, or interact with a friend and just have like a fun, spontaneous moment with friends, um, on a regular basis. And like, you know, now that looks like zoom calls and things like that. But, um, 
I, I'm also not happy. Like, right. If I've like burnt the bridge on work too hard, I, I don't do well. So for me, I'm an extrovert. That's an important part of my, my equation. Um, and then the other thing is I do take real vacations where one at, on Saturdays, I always take Saturdays off. I barely, barely look at my phone. I play with my kids. I get outside. I do physical activity. I garden. I mean, I do, I, I, I like to cook. I do, you know, all the basic things. I, I love laundry. I love to do laundry. Um, isn't that totally nuts? I love laundry. Um, and I just like to do basic things and Saturday's my free day. And then I always try to take two weeks off once a year where I really take it off. And that's always been my best ideas come. It's like a lightning rod hits my brain. And all of a sudden, like this problem that I couldn't solve because I'm out of, I'm out of my element it solves itself. And so I always say it's like something special always happens when I go on vacation and it's because my brain shifts into a different mode. Um, and I, I believe that's good for everybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, and for everybody listening who sees not working as taking time away from work to Alexis point here, it can be inspiration for work. And it also allows you to go back to work in, in a more inspired way um, too. And, and by the way, when you say vacations, right? Okay, so the reason why I love this book, a big part is it's not just sort of money for money's sake. It's really working backwards from who do you want to be? How do you want to live? What are your values? And knowing if it's a two-week vacation, I mean, there's a diagram in here where you really force us to kind of project how much money we think we're going to cost in a vacation. You know, is it a in the mountains vacation? Is it a beach vacation? And even though we might not know exactly, you know, visualizing and having the numbers and starting today. Financial advice. Uh, there's so much you could give and that would be its own talk. What is one thing that if people off this, on this call, if they, one thing that they should take away when it comes to money, do you have one thing you can give us? I know you have so much advice. <laughs> I mean, I have so much advice. Um, I would really say, uh, the book financially fearless that you just held up. Uh, I wrote it because for every woman on this call, you have to take a seat at the table with your wallet and you will never be as confident or capable or stable if you can't manage your money. And it's in the same way that you have to learn hygiene to stay healthy. It's part of hygiene. And it's, it's just shocking to me that it's not taught in every school and high school in the country. It's insane, in fact. But so that's why I wrote the book. So I would just say, take a seat at the table with your wallet. Um, and you know, I remember the first time I really got my finances fully in order. And that doesn't mean that you don't have things to work on or extra savings you need to create. But I fully felt like I understood how it works. My stress levels went permanently down. And I said, I'm fully safe and stable. And it just gave me confidence to go do things that I do in my career because I know I can take care of myself no matter what, no matter what could happen. And I think it's just a really critical way to live your life. Mm -hmm. And little stuff every day does count for anybody who's feeling overwhelmed with debt or things like that. You can still put away a little bit. By the way, two people wrote it. LearnVest was one of many go-to resources and taught me a ton about being financially independent and financially confident. Thank you. I miss LV. And thank you. Love you. Financially fearless. Changed my life. Many excellent points. Um, how I... Uh, last questions on, on learn best before we can move on to what you're doing now profit somebody wrote in uh how long did it take for you to turn a profit um and then maybe scaling a little bit once once you got to making profit i mean your business sort of changed i assume at that point so what was the inflection point of okay i think this is working too this is definitely working and we're making money Um, so a few things. So basically, um, we were building software that made it accessible for anybody to get access to a financial plan. And right as we were getting acquired is when our revenue was rapidly growing. Um, and we, we found a new business unit. And, you know, it took, again, bringing brilliant people around me, giving them the space to push me and, and think outside of the box. Um, and that's right when we got acquired. Um, and then just for everyone so you know, LearnVest got acquired by Northwestern Mutual, which is a phenomenal company. Same value system as LearnVest. They believe in everyone having access to a financial plan. And I, I signed up for the acquisition because Northwestern Mutual has 5 million families in the country that they gave a plan to. 
And they said, we want to take your software and go give it to everybody. And I believe everyone in the country should have access to a plan. And the fact that they could get to 5 million people overnight, I kind of said, I built this special thing. I should give it to somebody who can give it to people faster. And so that's how we thought about it. So that just gives you a sense of the why behind that acquisition. Um, and then I, and all the content and everything is now lives on North Russia Mutual. So I miss Learn Best too, um, but it's now on North Russia Mutual, which I think is a, a bigger a bigger home. It's uh, so I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, you asked about scaling a business. Um, you know, I really learned that about scaling a business once I got inside North Russia Mutual because overnight I went from you know my little uh, millions of dollars of budget to run Learn Best, which grew and grew. But then overnight, I got to run a seven hundred million dollar business unit, like with had almost at one point, you know, uh, eighteen hundred employees, um, and that's when you really grow. Uh, and I had a, just a wonderful experience there. So, who like had? I mean, trial and error, obviously, but this is high stakes. So, did you have somebody helping you learn along the way? I mean, how did you keep going when I'm assuming things? You know, it was a roller coaster, I imagine. It was a total roller coaster, um, uh, and most acquisitions are, in fact. Most of the time, the founder wants to run out the side door as fast as they humanly can. Um, I really credit uh, uh, the, the CEO of North Russia Mutual is the most wonderful guy. His name's John Schlifsky, and he's just special, and um, he really is just a great guy, and he kept me in the building, and then also they hired me two coaches, um, and it was amazing, and I basically... Um, learned that I was impatient on steroids. <laughs> um, and no, they, they, they really did. They taught me so much. And I, I, I actually just am thinking, hey, it's time for me to email them how grateful I am to them. But um, I just got even more feedback and even more input. And it really, um, as a young person, it was just such a gift. Right. Because what it takes to start a business is not necessarily the same skill set as you know, sustaining a business, growing a business, and then all of a sudden you're working for this older corporation, right? This institution. I mean, it takes skill sets and mindsets. And was there ever, you know, in those transitions, right, from starting a company, growing a company, selling the company, and then having, you know, thousands of employees, how did you navigate the transitions? In the same way that I'd navigate everything else, which is I made sure that I had people around me that would tell me good feedback. Um, there were things I had to get better at. There were things I was really good at. Um, and, you know, we had really clear plans of what we needed to accomplish. And so we were really focused on those plans. Um, and it was, it was just a great experience. Um, but just like anything else, like I, I, I call it ABL, always be learning. I am always in learning mode, always. I think I learned three new things a day. Um, and it, it's a mindset that I think is a really important one as a founder and an entrepreneur. Also, you know, those things that you're scared, you, you know, let's pretend plugging in the TV and getting it all set up where you're like, Oh, that's going to be a pain or setting up a printer. Let's just be honest. It's such a pain to set up. A <laughs> that's kind of how most of running a company is. It's like, you just have to teach yourself to love setting up printers because, and then one day you're like, there's really nothing I can't at least in a basic way, wrap my head around. And it's just, we, we create these mindsets of like, oh, that's hard. It's going to be bad. Or like, oh, I don't know how to make a souffle. I think one thing I really do love is just constantly forcing myself to learn things I don't want to do um, and getting good at it. And it doesn't mean I'm the best at anything. It's just, there's, there's nothing I'm truly like horrible at. Um, and it's just a learning mindset. And I think it's a really critical one when you're running companies and when you're trying to figure out life. Um, and now I'm a parent to three little kids. And, you know, there's probably parts of parenting that I'm really bad at right now. And I just constantly give myself the ability to be like, I, I always be learning, always get better every day. And you kind of take everything one day at a time. And I, I will say that's a really important mantra that I personally have. And everybody's different. You kind of have to learn what works for you. Um, I just take everything one day at a time. Some days are really stressful. And I'm like, oh my God. There's a lot of stress. This isn't working. Two things are going sideways. And on those days are the days sometimes I'm like, you know what? I'm ending the day at 3 p.m. I'm going to go for a walk, hang out with my kids, you know, watch a movie, have a glass of wine, whatever it is that you need to do, and just start the next day better. Because life's hard. And, you know, we're going through COVID plus everything else, plus like 
we are living through the most insane moment in history right now. And just like, I'm human. And I think being human is really critical, which is like some days just, you can only take it one day at a time. Um, but when I show up tomorrow, I will start the day at 150%. That's how I, I, it's my mantra. I start the day at 150%. But some days the day gets to end at noon because it sucks so bad. <laughs> um, and there were days at Learn Bass where someone would quit or something would go wrong. And I would just be like, oh my God, this is really a lot. And on those days, I would walk out of the building, walk around the block, call my husband, call a best friend, call, and I think the day has to be over because today already was so bad. I just have, it has to be over. Um, go get a good night's sleep. My mom has this mantra, which is like, everything is better after a good night's sleep, get a good night's sleep, and then start the day the next day with 150%. And so as you're trying to do superhuman things, that's a pretty good system to have in place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you said try to learn three new things, I see that. Love that. Um, we get a lot of people, you know, concerned about not being a perfectionist, right? Not wanting to get things wrong. But here's the thing about what you just said. Learning something new means you're setting yourself up to maybe stumble. So, you know, so for you, you know, have you charted your progress based on or defined progress, defined success by the new things that you've learned? Um, or has your kind of definition of success changed over the years? Um, so I really do think for everybody you've, you know, I started this, ch this, this, this uh, chat today by saying you only get one life. Um, life is super special. It's really fragile. And you've got to figure out what you want to do in your life. And one of the amazing things about getting and hitting my thirties and, you know, in your twenties, you're kind of like, who am I? What am I good at? And by the time you're in your thirties, you know, hopefully you know who you are. It feels really good just to be you, just be yourself, like be authentic and be yourself and who gives a shit if some people don't like your decisions and your choice and your plan? Like if you live for other people's filters, it really sucks. Like you're, I can promise you, you're not going to like that life. And so, so for me, I think, you know, through this process, I've like been able to let my hair down. I'm like, this is who I am. Not everybody's going to like, by the way, I'm like a strong, empowered woman. The world still sees strong, empowered women oftentimes as like naturally, tough and me as you meet me you will learn I'm not one ounce of I'm like if anything I will be like you want my sweatshirt here you can have it um and like we're just changing the world and I think it's just you've you've got to be able to like yourself I think that's a really important ingredient to success um I actually saw so I again I have little kids I saw this amazing um I, I and I wish I saved it but I saw this amazing quote, which is like, it doesn't matter if you speak four languages and have a PhD in math, if you don't like yourself, because you actually can't do anything. Right. You won't be able to accomplish things if you are super mean to yourself, your biggest critic. And like, we all have our own insecurities. And one day I just flipped the switch and I was like, I like Alexa. She's a really good person. She tries really hard and I'm on her team. And like, that switch, and I don't know when it happened, maybe I was 20, maybe I was 22, but by the time I was 30, I was like, I'm really proud. I know I'm a good human in my heart. I really believe in doing the right things. Integrity is everything, and I know I won't get it all perfectly, but I think that switch is, I think, really important, um, and then surrounding yourself with people who see you and know you, and, and they see you. It just, it creates this platform for being able to thrive because you're going to just do your best. And I think it's a really important pep talk that you want to give yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just, again, once you can be your authentic self, it's just like, it's really hard to live in someone else's paradigm. It's really easy to be yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you'll just find like the success follows you because people see you and they can feel you and they can get a sense of who you are. Um, and then you asked about goals. I always set goals. I start every year. And um, I, I, think, uh, I think I posted this to Instagram, but my goal for this year was to have more fun. Okay. Uh, and it was just a really, I mean, it's just That's such so good. And, then, and then of course, 2020 happened and it's like, holy shit. Um, but it's just, I, I find that when I'm having fun, success even follows me more because I'm like, I like to have fun in business.
business. I like to set really interesting goals. I like to back entrepreneurs. Um, and I will tell you what I'm doing at Inspired Capital in a second, but um, I like to, I love to solve big problems and I really want to help figure out a way to put the 18 million people in this country who aren't employed to work. And like, it's my value system. I grew up in, you know, my mom's side of the family literally came from nothing. Um, I actually went back and looked at my grandparents' house. I thought it was so big when I was little in my head, like in upstairs and I grew up in a house that didn't have a second floor. And so I remember being like, my mom was fancy. And then I went back and looked at my grandparents' house and I was like, and my mom grew up in South Bend, Indiana. Oh, Pete Buttigieg. At, at Pete Buttigieg. And I, I literally was like, mom, you were literally, I think, poor. And she was like, yeah, we didn't have a lot. And it was like, it just was like incredible um, to be like, really, it, it just like, and you know, I just, I, I'm so proud of my roots. I'm so proud of my mom. Um, and now my mom's a nurse and I, she does great work. And, um, and so I think just, you know, I, I, I really like to have fun and I, um, I do set goals every year. And I think the more that you can just be proud of who you are and where you came from, the better. Hmm. Lindsay said, this is the pep talk I needed. And then Pam goes, totally agree, Lindsay. I can't stop nodding. Ha ha ha. Okay. Uh, that's awesome, guys. Uh, inspired capital. Okay. So now you're on the other side of the table where you're funding entrepreneurs. This is the question I'm sure you get all the time, but a question that our audience wants to know. Who are you looking for? How do you decide uh, who you want to fund? Yep. So first, I mean, can you now understand why I called my firm Inspired Capital? It literally came out of my mouth one day where I you know, our partnership is really special. Um, the, the four partners between all of us, we've actually built and scaled and sold and been part of 10 successful businesses. And so for us, like my, 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 my intellectual love is building businesses. I love doing it. It's fun for me. It's like an intellectual playground. And, um, so what we do, so we're located in New York City, obviously not now with COVID, we're all in different locations trying to stay safe, um, but we raised $200 million. Um, we're actually one of, I, I'm proud of this and I'll say this since we're on a call with all women, um, you know, we, we are one of the largest funds founded by a female that exists in the country, which is by the way, so annoying mm -hmm. um, because I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, happy to change that, you know, that dynamic. Um, but it's also at the same time, I'm like, uh, like <laughs> the fact that I'm a female shouldn't matter. Um, uh, but it's, it's true. So we're helping change that conversation. And actually this week, a magazine cover is coming out with me and my three kids. And literally the subject of the magazine says, this is what a venture capitalist looks like. And I'm like, hell yeah. Um, cause I'm a working mom and like, you can have kids and work hard and be successful. And it's, I think we're changing that visual too. Um, but Inspired Capital backs the entrepreneurs of tomorrow who want to go build big ideas. So we invest in technology businesses, software businesses, platforms, marketplaces um, of people who want to change the world. Um, and we are really excited to do it. We called it Inspired Capital because, again, the words just came out of my mouth one, one day where I was like, you know what? It's Inspired Capital. We want to back the entrepreneurs who see what needs to be solved, the problems of tomorrow that want to go fix them. And we want to help them get there faster, better, stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we do. Uh, so yeah, that's us. And as I said, you know, follow me on Instagram. I'm just at Alexa Von Tobel. I, I manage my own Instagram so you can DM me and I try to help as many people as I can. Mm -hmm. Pam wants to know, and I want to know as well, which magazine is it? Can you tell us so we can look out for it? it, it I mean, you would love it. So it's a magazine, um, in, uh, uh, Meredith, the biggest magazine company, they own Real Simple and, you know, every other magazine, literally people. They just launched a brand new magazine around women and money called Millie. Millie, really? yeah, yeah. And uh, literally, um, and they were like, Alexa, who better to be the cover of a money magazine for women? Um, and they were like, we want to put your kids in it because we think we're changing what that looks like. And so it literally is, uh, I, hit, I think it hits the stands this morning. Um, so yeah. Okay, good, good. Cause I was quoted in Millie. So I was, that makes me so happy uh, that I even knew which it was. And you're so perfect for it. Um, other question that I'm sure you get all the time is pitching, right? So let's say somebody is trying to get, uh, I was gonna say sponsored, but trying to get funded by you what are some fantastic pitches that you've seen and what's the advice for, for people who are interested in pitching investors? I mean, I think the most important thing when you're pitching investors is they really want to know that they're backing somebody who knows that they're going to do it for a decade. 
it, it, um, there's actually this, um, and I don't know where I read this one, but there was this great thing, which is it pretty much takes seven years to do anything really well. To do anything truly exceptionally well takes about seven years. And so when you're building a business, like just know that, you know, I, I, I stood up inspired capital for it to be my life's work now. And so in my mind, I'm like, it's going to take me 30 years to accomplish what I want to accomplish. Um, and I think giving yourself, so when, it, when you're pitching an investor, they want to hear that, like, you're going to put your life's work into this um, and that you're not going to give up. And I always joke, there's only plan A, there's no plan B um, when it comes to success because you have to figure it out. There's no plan B. Um, and I think that that's, um, I look for the resilient entrepreneurs who are going into something clear eyed. They know it's going to be hard. They know it's going to take forever. They know it's going to be their life's work. And that's what wakes them up. So I look for people who also stress, chaos, they wake up to that. And one of the things I do think I learned about myself is that stress doesn't really shut me down. Um, when things get really stressful, I wake up. Um, you know, I, I have a can-do attitude. I'm hardwired in that way. And I have an optimistic point of view and I'm like, we'll figure it out. And I really believe that. And I think that that you're looking for that because building a business is superhuman. It's so hard. It's really, really hard. Um, and everything will go wrong. And in fact, I can promise you when I back a founder, I look them in the eyes and I say, I can promise you, you're going to have some of the worst days of your life. And I can promise you it's going to be miserable. That's a guarantee. That's not even a maybe. Right. But we're going to have the best time ever doing it. And we're going to find a way through those miserable moments and we're going to win. Um, and so that's what I look for. I really look for somebody who doesn't pretend that it's not going to be that way. It, they, they really understand that it will be. Yeah. Well, so ladies get paid. It's been a journey. We were also sued for gender discrimination by a group of men's rights activists. So Alexa's not lying when things go wrong and you have no idea how wrong it can go. Um, and I, I appreciate, you know, your everything is a puzzle and an opportunity, an opportunity to problem solve. Um, and that, uh, but one question about, you want to know that they're in it for the long haul. What about people who have exit strategies, right? I thought that was a good thing to be able to come to it and say, well, we would like to be bought. And I'm also curious in, in LearnVest if that was something you had in the back of your mind when you began the company. No. So, so one of the things is, of course, you want people who like can conceptually think of exit strategies, but if you're building a business just to sell it, you tend not to be the person who builds the business properly. If you're building the business to say, I want to create as much value as possible with the happiest customers to create as much shareholder value as possible, it's a different mindset than if you're like, I want to build a business to sell it. The businesses where you say, this will be my life's work and I'm not looking to sell it are the businesses that get acquired. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and so it doesn't mean like, so, so you ask the question, I always knew in my head, LearnVest could get acquired by this company, this company, this company. And I was aware of it, but it's when you have the passion over the profit mindset, you end up in a position where you're just more successful because you're not doing it for the money. And Money follows when you're not doing it for the money. It does. If you're truly in it to solve a problem, a big one, with, where lots of people and customers will be thrilled, you're going to build something of real value. If you're trying to create a puzzle that perfectly gets acquired, it will never happen. It just won't. And um, that again, it doesn't mean that you can't get acquired. It just means if you're trying to get acquired, you tend not to get acquired. Okay. That's, um, I'm taking notes on that. Um, COVID, ah, the future of COVID. Oh man, what are the opportunities you see in the, in the context of the present crisis and should people be starting businesses now? Yes. Um, if you go look at the stock exchange, the S&P 500, more than half of the companies that are in the S&P 500 were created at a time of asymmetric dislocation. We right now, as we all, you know, literally I'm taking this from my bedroom, um, we are living through a fundamentally category creating moment in life. There will be pre-COVID and post-COVID and the world will never be the same going forward. And if you haven't thought things like, this is permanently impaired things like business travel. This is permanently impaired how we will think about medical safety. This is permanently impaired how we will think about our homes. My home, I will never think about anything that it will always be an office. We will work differently in the future. I think all of us are quickly learning that we can actually still work 
and be much closer to our kids and our families. And I have put my children to bed almost every night for the past five months. That is incredible. And I've still been able to accomplish as much in my work life because all of the fat, all of the, all of the things, taxis, transportation, logistics, all the things that I didn't need to do are now gone and I'm happier for it. And so the world is in asymmetric dislocation right now. And this is when category defining businesses get built. They get built when the world goes on its tilt and we are in a tilt. If I mean, we all know that we are all cooking more. And one thing is, um, so when I studied psychology undergrad to take your arms from this way and to learn to cross them the opposite way, it literally takes 28 days. We've all been living like this for five months. If you think for a moment, we haven't already created new patterns in our life. I used to eat out three to five nights a week. Now I'm eating out not at all. Uh, minus maybe a pickup here and there for, you know, if we pick up takeout, that's permanent. And all of these things are happening and we are fundamentally learning different patterns right now, but not just the America, the planet. Think about that. It's like really mind boggling. And so I think we're in probably one of the best times to start a company. And in fact, I think this truly is such an incredible moment in life. And I think we got forced to slow down. We got forced to sit still. We got forced to reconnect. We remembered community. Community is invaluable, invaluable to all of our lives. And I think, you know, you've created an incredible community right here on this call today. We need one another. The planet needs us. And so it's just an awesome, awesome moment. It's a scary moment. COVID's real. It's going to hurt more people. And I really can't wait for us to fix it. Um, but I really do believe that this is a time where we are going to, so I, I have this quote, we woke up in 2020, we are going to end this year in 2030. We've advanced a decade in this calendar year, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And guys, it doesn't mean that we're going to suffer till 2030, <laughs> partly maybe, but it's, it's an optimistic look into, into 2030. Um, FinTech obviously has, you know, changed over the years. Somebody wanted to know, you know, what do you think the impact COVID will have on the FinTech? industry? Anything at all? I mean, it's already ramped up and made, you know, leaps and bounds of the kinds of fintech products that we're using. Do you see COVID playing a part in, in what, you know, the way things grow and maybe even new products that come up in fintech? Well, the thing that truly does actually wake me up, like I wake up some mornings at 3.30 just because my brain gets going and I can't help it. And it's one of the fun parts of being me is that I don't always get a good night's sleep. Um, and Truly right now, there's about 20 million Americans unemployed. We went into this world pre-COVID with 78% of the country living paycheck to paycheck. Many people on this call, most of us are stressed out financially. And then we went into this world where we just made everything uncertain. And so I really do think deeply about how do we put 20 million people back to work? And I think what we're going to see in terms of innovation is new ways of getting access to working. And, you know, I met a, a founder I'm chatting to later today, actually, um, who is, has a vision of a platform where everybody can sell an hour of their time to do anything that people need. And I'm like, oh, anybody can work from wherever they are via just Zoom. That's really amazing to think about. And so it's those sort of platforms. How do we put people back to work that I'm pretty obsessed about right now? I'm also obsessed with the concept of a self-driving wallet. I literally want everyone's wallets because it's just math to actually just go like this and your wallet should do all of its work for itself. It's a mathematical equation of where should your savings go? How do you maximize your 401k? How do you pay off credit card debt? And it should happen every hour. And right now it doesn't. And we helped back a business that's working to solve that problem because it would help everyone in the country and on the planet. And so it's those sort of big concepts that, you know, I always joke, I do spend my life thinking 10 years forward. It's really fun. I think the future is bright and, and wonderful. And um, it's just a really fun job um, that I really believe in. And so that's the sort of things I think about, which is how do you solve some of the biggest problems um, which is why I think it's a really good job for me because I care about making the planet better. I care about making our communities better. I care about making us safer. Um, and I, you know, I grew up in a family of doctors where it was beaten into me. You wake up every day and help others. And 
I didn't become a doctor. So I'm like the black sheep in my family because both my brothers are doctors. Um, but, but I, you know, I go to work every day thinking about how do we make the world a better place? Hmm. I realized we started early actually. So can I, can I take five more minutes of your time? Does that work? Five more minutes. Go for it. Uh, or maybe let's do three. Okay. How to find a good mentor and keep the relationship going when the mentor is pressed for time. This is a question from somebody else. Also your mentor. And if no one at the moment, your dream mentor. Yep. So, um, a few things, um, I really, really, um, I, I, I think of mentorship just as friendship. So I found that my, like right now I'm my next door neighbor was my first investor in learn best. She's 75 years old. She's a dear friend and she's literally just become a friend, but I go to her for all sorts of advice and she's got perspectives that I don't have. And so I approach mentorship as friendship. Um, her name's Ann Kaplan. She's a wonderful woman. Um, and I think what I've learned is I'm 36. I don't have all the answers. As I said, I, I approach most things knowing that I don't have all the right answers. And so surrounding yourself with people who have, you know, my business partner, Penny Pritzker, she was secretary of commerce for Obama. Um, you know, I went into business with her because I was like, Penny at 60, you've seen more of the world that I possibly can. And so I like to surround myself with exceptional people who are different than me, but also who have more experience than me because they can help me cover my own blind spots. Um, so that's how I think about mentorship. And I really do approach it as friendship. You know, it, it, it truly is, you know, life's really short. Most people I work with are some of my best friends. Um, so that's one. And then um, you asked the question about who would be my dream mentor. Honestly, guys, Michelle Obama, yeah. <laughs> like what a badass. Um, and I read her book and um, what I, what I admire most about her is it really is the mindset of like, when people go low, you go high that's the sort of person I want to be known to be, which is that um, we're all going to have moments where we're not perfect, but like, let's keep the bar high. And I just think we're in a world right now and I won't get into politics where we have gotten so low, like what on earth is going on? Like, this is the United States of America. We set a tone for the planet. We need truly to remind people that integrity values, how we behave matters. And again, I'm reminded that every minute because I have three little people who mimic anything I do that's silly, um, you know? And it, it's just true. Like the world watches us and mimics us, little people to the planet. And so I just really believe that um, how we act matters. I deeply believe that. And I want us to be known as citizens and people and leaders, we need leadership. And so and I think Michelle Obama is a wonderful leader. Mm. Have you ever considered running for office? You'd be fantastic. But uh, uh, right now, let me just like, you know, get through inspired capital. Um, but no, at some point I, I wouldn't be off the, 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 the realm of, you know, I, 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 I believe in service. Um, and I think you need people who really care um, to run for office. Um, and anyway, so, so yeah. Uh, let me first just, I don't know, was not 2020 and we'll, <laughs> let's just first get through this One year. One day at a time, but good. I'm glad that we're in things is not off. How can we support you? Let, let's wrap it up here. So, you know, you talked about your podcast. Uh, we should put the links into the chat. And we'll also, everybody here, we're going to send a follow-up email. So following you, staying in touch, supporting you. What do you, what do you want us? How do we do this? Um, I, as I said, you know, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram. I try wherever I can help somebody. If like one intro that takes five minutes changes somebody's life, I, I always try to do it. Um, and then if you like any of my books, write a nice review on Amazon. I actually have never asked anybody to write a review until this minute, which I'm like, how dumb am I? But I, I'd had my babies when we launched books and, you know, I financially fearless was a New York times bestseller instantly and things like that. But like, um, that's the nicest thing you can do for an author. So thank you for asking. Good. And everybody here, we, we often think that if there's somebody who's higher than us, well, what, you know, they're the ones helping us. And we think, well, I'm so junior, like, what can I possibly do to support them? There's always something you can do and you should always offer. That's very easy. Writing review. I will write one. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks for doing a little bit of overtime with us. And, you know, sorry, we couldn't make Instagram live work, but it's not our fault. It's technology. So we'll blame, we'll blame those platforms. Uh, 
I, I love that you were here. Thank you. I know your time is precious. Thanks to everybody. No, I'm happy to do it. And really guys go out there, go get them, bet on yourself, dream big. No one else is going to dream for you. Yes. Yes, guys. I'll see you on, on email and, and I'll send a recording in the next week. I appreciate it. Stay safe. Stay well. Everybody stay safe. Bye-bye.